First case we'll hear is In Re Estate of James Irwin Sr. Can we please proceed? Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Alfonso Irwin and I'm appearing on behalf of the appellant. I do request that any time I have remaining, I'll be able to use in any rebuttal from the lady. Now you can save a particular amount of time. It's not any time remaining. Uh, well, uh, I would like to reserve at least five minutes. I understand the court said we have 20 minutes, so I would say at least the last five It'll minutes. It'll be five minutes then, yes. okay? Yes. Please go on. Okay. This appeal involves five issues raised by the appellant, Beatrice King, who is a former personal representative removed by the probate court of Tuscola County, sent an assignment from Saginaw County. This appeal raised five issues. The first issue is whether the uh, separated spouse in this matter, Maggie Irwin, should be excluded as a uh, surviving spouse of James Irwin Sr. on the MCL 700.2801. 700 E. Friend, friend, two friend. Second issue is whether Maggie should be asked to make a contribution to the estate for receiving entirety's property. The third issue is whether there's justification for uh, King's removal and a sanction of approximately thirteen thousand dollars in actual attorney's fees. Fourth issue is in regard to the venue, which which was requested by other heirs and was not granted. Fish, Fifth and final issue is whether the uh, probate court judge sitting in Tuscola County should have been disqualified. The court has asked both parties to pay special attention to the interpretation of MCL 700.2801E2, which addresses the exclusion of a surviving spouse for the purposes of in-state in intestate succession. Uh, the purpose of this interpretation is determined what, did the, what was the legislature's intent by providing that a spouse should be excluded if the spouse is willfully absent for a period of one year or more at the date of the decedent spouse's death or deserted the decedent spouse at least one year or more at the time of the death. I will also address the other issues raised which the appellant chose not to address. Two Court of Appeals opinions have looked at this question and have rendered uh, one published opinion by the Peterson Court and one unpublished opinion on this matter has been appealed from the Irwin Court. Uh, in Peterson, the court determined that willful absence meant that the excluded surviving spouse is a party who left or caused the absence. Furthermore, Peterson determined that physical separation was a controlling factor and emotional separation was not relevant. <clears throat> the intent to abandon marital rights was not to be considered as a factor because it was determined by the surviving spouse's absence. That was from the Peterson decision. The, the appellant submits that Peterson decision is a proper interpretation of MCL 700.2801 print E print two print print e print. The appellant proposes that uh, the court should consider that the moving party seeking the exclusion of a spouse to have met its burden of moving forward if that's if that party establishes the absence of surviving spouse for more than one year and a burden to produce a then shift to the the spouse to produce evidence that the absence was not a willful absence, but there were circumstances surrounding the absence that would uh, take her out of, or he out of the exclusion uh, for willful absence. The appellee will argue that the, sorry. <clears throat> The appellant would argue that the court should adopt the holding of the Irwin case, and, uh, and Pelly has stated specifically that willful absence is not defined exclusively by 
physical separation but includes consideration of emotional bonds and connections between the spouses, requires proof that a spouse intends to abandon his or her marital rights before the same can be lost. Thus, the appellant states that the overriding principle of the statute is that only a spouse who has consciously failed to participate in the marriage should be prohibited from taking a share of the deceased spouse's intestate estate. What our concern is and what the opponent's concern is is that in this manner, the intent behind MCL 72801 paren e paren uh, 2 paren is that those spouses should be excluded who consciously fail to participate in a marriage. In this matter, appellant submits that Maggie consciously excluded herself from participating in the marriage. And what does participate in the marriage mean? Did you act as husband and wife? There's been some arguments made that there was an ongoing relationship. I will submit to the court that whenever there's a remarriage and whenever there's children involved, there's going to be a relationship between the spouses and between the children because in most instances that's the definition of, of a family. Mr. Irwin, uh, if I look through the record, uh, I see um, an affidavit that was notarized by Becky Du Russell. Are you familiar with her? No, I'm not. Uh, Becky Du Russell notarized an affidavit uh, that appears to have been filed with a verified complaint that was signed by you in the uh, General Motors litigation, which asserts that Maggie and James were still husband and wife, wife and husband, uh, and asking General Motors to reinstate uh, pension benefits. And this seems, appears to be different than what your pleadings asserted, that there was an unsigned affidavit we have a signed affidavit in our record. Okay, well, Yana, what was submitted to the court and before the hearing was an unsigned affidavit. And what came up on appeal was an unsigned affidavit. Yes, the Court of Appeals did allow the submission of a signed affidavit. I challenged the submission of that unsigned affidavit because the unsigned affidavit had a different notary that allegedly signed the affidavit. This was an entirely different one. I would also submit to the court and, and Justice Weiler that the affidavit only states that they were husband and wife. The appellant's position is, is that to fall under MCL 700.2801, print E, print 2, is that you have to be married. That's the only thing that alleges is that they were married. That happened in 2010. Uh, Mr. Irwin passed away several years after that. And so our position is, is that marriage should not be the controlling factor. Marriage is a factor to get within the, per, the, the preview of MCL 700.2801 paren E paren 2. You have to be married. Okay, that's the first stage. That should not be the controlling stage. What the legislature, legislature's intent, as we interpret it, was that you have to show that you were physically absent or willfully absent for one year or more. The question before the court is, what does that include? Is it just the physical absence or does it include other factors? We submit that, that it should start with the physical absence as a presumption. If that is proven, then the burden should be upon the spouse that's going to be excluded to produce evidence to show that this absence was not, not willful. If we consider the time in this case, we have submitted that this time period alone should have shown that the absence was willful. There was no marital relationship. Maggie moved out of the marital home. She never moved back into the marital home. Maggie did not, as in Peterson, come by the home, cook, and care for Mr. Irwin. Counsel, good morning, good morning. And, and welcome. How are we supposed to measure all that? Like, 
I'm just, you know, I'm trying to grapple your argument and help me to understand how would we be able to measure what it is that you're putting forth today? Well, yeah, no, what I'm putting forth today is, is that we look at the time period, and once that time period is established, then it should be upon the party that's going to be excluded to produce any other evidence to show, because it'd be very hard for the party moving for the exclusion to show that there's any other factor that would disqualify. I think uh, that would come up from the party that's going to be excluded. The burden that, that I'm arguing is that we should show the exclusion of time. And the other cases that were decided, whether you go back to Harris or whether you go back to Peterson. And Peterson, the actor in that case, was a deceased spouse. But there were still other factors that were brought up. The party moved forward to show that there was an absence, but the other factors came in. The burden shouldn't be on the party that is seeking the exclusion. The burden to satisfy what standard? In other words, you're saying that the departing spouse does not sever the relationship merely by the physical departure, but that once a year has elapsed, that triggers his, obliga his or her obligation to explain and presumably justify the departure. By what standard? What is it? What is it that would overcome the fact that there's been a physical separation of greater than a year? Well, Your Honor, I think that there uh, has been reported in, in other cases. You looked at the facts surrounding the separation. I understand uh, the facts, okay. but what is the standard after you Well, just the standard the to produce. I mean, the bur I don't, I'm not arguing that the burden shifts, but I, I think by a preponderance of evidence, the so-called excluded spouse should show evidence that her absence or his absence was not willful, that there was some type of relationship, an ongoing relationship. It's, it's hard, uh, and, and I guess from, from my standpoint, it's hard to establish a definitive standard because it may be different in every case that comes before the court. I guess we're in the business of standards, and obviously the departure itself for a year was willful in the sense that it was done knowingly but you presumably have a different concept of what willful is intended to communicate. And my question is, again, what is the standard? I've been gone for more than a year, but I still feel that I have a, a, a sufficient connection with my spouse to be entitled to take from my spouse. By what standard do I demonstrate that to the court? And, and Your Honor, what I'm arguing is that if as the moving party, I establish the absence of one year, then we have met our burden and our, our requirement to produce evidence. Now, the standard for the spouse is going to be excluded, uh, it, I don't think that that should be on the party or the standard should be on the party that's seeking the exclusion. Willfulness or willful absence I cannot speak to the court and explain a standard that I would say, okay, this is a standard should, that should be met. Uh, I know that in an opinion produced in the lower court, they indicated that, well, whether there was a working condition, whether there was a, um, uh, an, an illness, I think that under those circumstances, that would take away or that would be mitigating factors that the court would have to consider. But for me to say, well, if the spouse can show this, because it could be different in every case. Um, but the rules should, rule should not be different in every case. The rules should not be different in, in what I'm, I, excuse me, what I'm arguing that that rule should be the burden is met if you're gone for over a year, physical absence. The other factors. Well, then what's the point of what's the point of the departing spouse attempting to explain himself if it's merely the one-year separation that triggers uh, the, the 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 operation of the statute? Well, if if that spouse, well, the burden doesn't change. It just shifts the burden to that excluded spouse to produce enough evidence to show that that absence was not a willful absence. As in Peterson, you, you, Peterson court said, if you're gone for over a year, you intended to, to leave, that's 
willful absence, the, survive, the alleged surviving spouse, you don't have to show an intent to abandon marital rights. And so from our standpoint, what we would argue to the court that that should be a standard that as long as you can establish the one year, excuse me, I understand that the court may look at other factors, but, but those factors should be something that the, the party that's going to be excluded should bring forth to determine willfulness. And determining what that willfulness is, was there an arrangement that this is only going to be temporary? Yeah. Was there an agreement that I will be coming back? I don't think that illness would cover that because if a person is ill, then that's, I don't consider that to be a, a, a willful. In this particular case, if you decided to leave and you haven't come back, have you did anything during that time period, that over that one year, to exhibit that you are still in a marriage, that you're acting as a spouse of the, of the deceased? That's what I feel should be the standard. Are you taking care, are you presenting any type of actions that would show that I consider myself to still be in this marriage? and not to be excluded. Your Honor, the, um, the other issue that, uh, other issues that I wanted to address was just the issue regarding uh, the removal of uh, Beatrice King as the personal representative. Um, we've detailed in our brief a submission amount of uh, uh, detail to indicate that her removal should not have should have been for cause and we don't think that there was appropriate cause that was presented to the court below. The court should be aware that at the time that Ms. King was removed, prior to that time a restraining order had been issued for her not to take any actions. The date of the removal was actually the date that had been set unilaterally by the appellate's counsel at that time. At the time of the hearing, uh, well, after the hearing, I, uh, because neither Ms. King or myself were present, we both had argued that, uh, that the appellate in the matter did not have standing because at that time she was not, or the determination had not been made that she was a surviving spouse. I also submitted to the court in my brief that if the appellee is considered to be a surviving spouse, then our argument about a contribution to the estate will go away. Because if she is a surviving spouse, then we can't ask her to make a contribution because she has a right to intestate secession to her share of the estate. But if she's not considered to be a surviving spouse under the, under the statute, then she should make a contribution to the estate. The appellant in this matter, Ms. King, was removed or challenged because she uh, had not filed, <coughs> excuse me, an inventory or an accounting. At the time of the removal, this is a nominal estate. There were roughly maybe $200. An inventory was not required to be filed there. The proper notices of continued administration had been filed. The party that raised the argument regarding the failure to file the accounting was actually a party that was challenged for concealing a, uh, a very valuable asset of the, uh, of the estate, that being a $5,000 promissory note that had not been fulfilled. Because Ms. King was removed for failing to provide that accounting and not given a chance to correct that accounting, she was assessed, and her counsel was assessed, a sanction of $13,000 in actual attorney's fees. They were also assessed the forfeiture of any fees that they could have earned from the administration of the estate or any money spent for the administration of the estate. At the time of the removal, no estate funds had been spent. Approximately only $200 had been obtained from the estate. The major assets of the estate was a 
bank account that the decedent held in approximately six figures. Um, other heirs had, or particularly one heir had noted that she had received some checks on behalf of the state. She never turned those checks over. The prior counsel for the appellee acknowledged that there was a mutual fund in the amount of $5,000. That was never a turnover. Um, Time has expired. Sorry. Thank you very okay. much, Mr. Irwin. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court, Valerie Coots Outway on behalf of the appellee, Maggie Irwin. Your Honors, this is a crazy world we live in, and married people live apart for any number of reasons these days. This court is well aware that sometimes that includes serious issues such as illness, occupation, education, or military service. And sometimes it's something as simple as wishing to maintain um, a tax break on both a house and a cottage. If appellant's position today is adopted as precedent, it literally calls into question the status of every married person living separately for whatever reason. This is absurd, Your Honors, and it cannot be what the legislature intended. Accordingly, I respectfully request that this honorable court affirm the decisions below, finding that Maggie Irwin did not willfully abandon James simply by living separately from him, and holding that she is the surviving spouse for purposes of the statute. I will show that this is the correct result for the following two reasons. First, Peterson and Irwin are not inconsistent decisions of the Court of Appeals. And second, when the legislature replaced the RPC with EPIC, it did not change the language of the statute, thereby adopting the ruling from Harris. To my first point, Your Honors, appellant would have you believe that Peterson and Irwin are inconsistent decisions by the Court of Appeals. That is simply not the case. Read together, the rules establish a roadmap for determining whether a spouse, surviving spouse is willfully absent for purposes of the statute. First, Peterson tells us to look at whether the parties um, were physically separated from each other and whether that separation existed for more than one year. If the answer is yes, then we move on. And Irwin tells us to take the next step, to look at what caused the separation to take a look at whether the parties maintained emotional bonds and connections. This is a fact-driven totality of the circumstances determination, which leaves it entirely within the discretion of the trial court. Here, it is undisputed that James and Maggie lived apart for many years, but the trial court found that they maintained an ongoing relationship despite that physical separation. This was evidenced by the joint lawsuit filed against General Motors in 2010, which, by the way, was merely a short two years before the decedent's death. It was also evidenced by the fact that Maggie provided care for James when he was ill, and the fact that James named Maggie as his beneficiary on the life insurance policy. Common sense dictates that these are not things that people do when they are abandoning their partner of 40 plus years. Additionally, Your Honors, the record is void of any evidence that suggests either party filed for divorce, that either party filed for separate maintenance, or that the couple entered into a property settlement agreement in anticipation of divorce. There was, however, sufficient evidence that the trial court found to support the finding that Maggie maintained emotional bonds and connections with James and that she did not willfully abandon him. Therefore, the ruling of the trial court was not clearly erroneous and the decision of the Court of Appeals must be upheld. To my second point, Your Honors, although EPIC does not define the phrase willfully absent, we know that the reporter's comment to the statute states that it's based on subsection 290 parens 1 of the RPC. That, that section. That section, you, when you started out, you said 
that people, I think, these days live apart more? Or Correct, Your Honor. Is it your position that the statute should mean something different today than when it was enacted in 1978, at least the prior version of the same statute? Uh, no, Your Honor. My position would be that we have to look at it in light of today, what's happening today. That it... I mean, if the statute's out, outdated, is it for this court to address it, or is that something you should go across the mall and address with the legislature? It's for this court to interpret it, Your Honor. Um, and although the black line rule would be the one year or more, that achieves an absurd result in this case nowadays, as well as any number of additional cases. And so it's long held that when an absurd result is achieved through a literal construction of the statute, an exception or qualification is presumed to be presumed to have been intended. And that's what I'm asking for here, Your Honor. Um, and Our job is really just to determine what willful absence means in the statute, right? Pardon me? It's just to determine what willful absence means in the statute, right? That's correct. Okay, because you, 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 you said abandonment a couple of times. That's a, a different word, right? So we, we have to That's be very correct. careful with the words that the legislature chose in this, in this statute. It appears to be an unusual statute, meaning that I didn't know I wasn't able to find uh, other states having a similar um, provision. Um, it obviously deals with people who are still married, right? That's and correct. So the fact that they were still married doesn't really have a bearing other than to say maybe the other provisions of this statute, the other subsections may not apply. Well, um, the, the fact that, she, that they were still married gets her in the door. And right. then you, the longstanding rule set forth in Harris, which was then adopted um, when EPIC did not change the um, language of the statute, was that, you know, once you once you get through the door, then it's on the party opposing um, opposing her as the surviving spouse. I mean, the court in, that you're, you're in Peterson that you're embracing says um, the court examined the statute looking at Harris and concluded that it would be absurd, to, same word you used, to interpret the statute to encompass emotional separation. So they think it's absurd the exact opposite way that you think it's absurd. So who, who, who's, who's more absurd, I guess? Um, I, I respectfully disagree, Your Honor. I, I believe that um, with regard to Peterson, we were looking at physical versus emotional separation. In this case, we're looking you know, first at the physical separation, which is what the statute addresses or what's at <coughs> issue in this case. Everybody knew that they lived apart for some 30 plus years, so we know that they were physically separate. That was not <coughs> the issue here. Um, in Peterson, they were looking at, even though um, you know they deliberately lived apart, she continued to do things for him. They continued to have um, you know, contact, that sort of thing. And they were looking in that case at whether the fact that he emotionally abandoned, does that does that meet the criteria? I would submit that emotional abandonment is separate from, or emotional separation, excuse me, is different from the physical separation. Here we had the physical separation, but she did stay emotionally connected. Um, there were bonds and ties between the parties. Um, and in, the, in RPC, that section described unilateral actions not approved or condoned by the decedent spouse. Um, Harris said the surviving spouse only sporadically lived in the marital home, refused to finance a trip to the Mayo Clinic that might have prolonged the decedent's life, and a divorce action was even pending. And even under those facts, the court still found him to be the surviving spouse. Um, this case clearly sets a high bar, Your Honors, and even though the legislature had an opportunity to change that bar, raise it, lower it, what have you, um, they didn't take that opportunity when they enacted the epic. So that holding stands. Um, and comparison, comparing Peterson to Harris, the common theme is action. The legislature's use of the word willfully in both statutes establishes the requisite intent that the individual must have in order to be disqualified as a surviving spouse. The intent is shown by actions. 
the individual must have acted. Both statutes use those words. Actions are the key to determining whether a surviving spouse forfeited his or her rights. We don't accidentally disengage ourselves from our spouses. We Co make a counsel. conscious decision to no longer participate counsel. in a marriage. Yes, sir. I'm not sure I completely understand what the debate is all about here. I mean, I, I, I listened to Mr. Irwin, and Mr. Irwin reflects a, a point of view that we should look at the one-year physical separation. But once that's elapsed, even then, there's going to be an opportunity, he says, for the court to assess what the reasons are for the separation. You're looking at emotional, um, um, emotional absence. And it seems to me that even those people who focus on physical absence still think that there's an opportunity under the term willfully to look at whether or not the willful absence is disrespectful or unconcerned with the marital bond entirely or whether it's a necessary function of life's exigencies and circumstances. So I guess I'm having a hard time understanding what the difference is between saying we're not just going to look at physical absence, we're also going to look at emotional absence and saying, well, we're going to look at these kinds of things in the context of what willfulness is all about. Aren't we kind of talking about the same thing? You in the context of emotional absence and the other side in the sense of willfully communicates much those same kind of considerations. Am I missing something big here? No, Your Honor, I believe we are kind of talking about the same thing. However, um, opposing counsel appears to be coming at it from um, a confusing angle, if, if you will. Um, he's asking this court, in this case, to say that because James and Maggie were physically separated for a year, that's it. She's not the surviving spouse. That's my understanding of what he's asking you to do today. Is he kind of saying at that point, there's at least an obligation, a burden to demonstrate why despite the one year physical separation, it's not willful in the sense of being disregardful and disrespectful of the marital bond? If I understood Appellant's argument correctly today, he suggests that the burden would shift to the surviving spouse to show that what the circumstances were. But as we learn from the holding in Harris, which I've previously indicated um, was adopted with Epic, that's not the case here. The case is if, if the opposition is going to come in and suggest or propose that a person who remained married, legally married to the decedent spouse up until the date of death is not entitled to the spousal protections, then they have a burden to show why. They have a burden to bring forth evidence. Um, it would be our position today that the standard that you asked him about should be clear and convincing um, because we know that forfeitures are not favored in the law. So that burden that they have to bring forth the evidence should be so high um, that... So high to say what? Clear and convincing is not a standard to me. What, what do you need to argue clearly and convincingly on behalf of? That would explain the standard. That the marital bond remains, that the marital bond has been broken, that life's necessities, um, or the military obligations, or health, your health circumstances necessitated this distance, or they didn't necessitate that distance, that to me is a standard. I envision, Your Honor, a similar standard to a div the divorce standard. We have a no-fault divorce standard in Michigan, and it basically says the objects of matrimony have been destroyed, and there remains no likelihood that the marriage can be preserved. That would be an appropriate standard here. Is that what you're arguing for here? Yes, I believe so. <laughs> In conclusion, Your Honors, the Court of Appeals correctly held that Maggie Irwin was the surviving spouse of James and that she did not willfully abandon him merely because she lived separately from him. Therefore, I respectfully request that this honorable court affirm the ruling of the Saginaw County Probate Court and the Court of Appeals and hold that Maggie Irwin was the surviving spouse of James Irwin for purposes of the statute. Thank you.
Are there any questions? Okay, thank you very much. The case will be submitted.